Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me Niall Murphy and here I am coming at you on May the 10th 2024 and um, it's nice and partly cloudy here at the moment considering it's always so bloody hot here in this corner of the Philippines when the sun's out it's actually quite nice and pleasant to be standing under a partly cloudy sky surrounded by all these lovely banana and coconut trees you know so uh, yeah anyway so what I would like to talk about today is I was thinking about how to politically unravel the UK in a positive way yeah I was listening to Miri Finch I don't know if you ever heard of her now I've heard some of her um, I've heard some of her uh, was it talks that she does on YouTube which come basically from her scripted WordPress blogs that she does she then does audio forms and releases them on YouTube um, she's a little bit too down certain conspiracy rabbit holes for my liking myself and I don't really believe her on everything or agree with her on everything but today I was listening to her and um, she was coming from um, experience um, rather than theory here she was talking about how she had um, run as an independent candidate um, at some constituency or something and um, she discovered that voting in the UK is not rigged. Now the way she worded it made me actually believe her. I thought, well, that's fair enough. So how, in that case, does Britain make such a pig's ear of its own political system if it's not rigged? And the reason why is because um, it comes down to the uni party people, those who are trying to um, preserve the status quo. Uh, they're very good at putting people off voting. So only a certain number of people vote. And as a result of that, most people feel too politically disenfranchised to vote and as a result of that um, nothing ever changes because no one believes anything will ever change and it's the manufacturing of consent they've manufactured everyone to consent to vote or apathy apparently now of course um, they've probably done that to me for all I know unless of course I can convince myself that the reason why I don't vote is for different reasons but the reason why, of course, um, you know, I don't like to involve myself in the political process is because I can't stand it. I really honestly can't. Now, um, I'm here. I don't feel like I have any political skin in the game. But this year is an interesting year because um, it looks like there's going to be a lot more independent candidates than were ever there before. It looks like the Tories could lose so many seats. It also looks like Britain is going, you know, um, going to find itself w uh, with an overwhelming majority Labour government that no one actually wants right and um, if this does prove that this is a result of voter apathy then um, I suppose that would be quite interesting but at the same time there's going to be a, maybe a lot more independence in there throwing spanners in the works it's also been going to be quite alarmist because it is quite clear that there is one group of people who know how to use the political system of the UK to infiltrate it and get what they want. And that is, of course, um, I have to say, people of a certain religion, which is often, um, you know, how to say, referred to as the religion of peace, they seem to act as a single block in the UK. And in their, what they call it, Borg-like collectivism, they will be taking advantage of it. This has happened in London. This is why Sadiq Khan keeps winning. I mean, no one bloody likes the man. And, but at the same time, it wouldn't surprise me if he's looking after his own, how to say, voter base, if they're not looking after everyone else, you see. And um, as a result of incredibly low voter turnout in the mayoral elections in London, that's what's caused him to, uh, you know. Now, of course, I don't know one way or the other. I have no advice from one way or the other for people when it comes to stuff like this. I kind of feel like whatever political paradigm I'm in, um, well, as soon as I start thinking about politics, I kind of feel like it's going halfway back to monkeyhood for me. You know, I just think it's the most uninvolved form of anything in the human condition that there is, and I think it's so bad that we're at this state that we're in at the moment. But um, I heard, and you've seen and heard everywhere you look, that if voting changed anything, they wouldn't allow it as a meme. And a lot of people, who are outside or, you know, how to say, who don't want to be part of the political normie sphere, believe that. Um, but according to Miri, Miri Finch, that's not actually the case. But this is the ultimate reverse psychological manipulation to manufacture the consent by everyone to not vote for anyone at all. Now, this might be the way in Britain, but in, of course, um, in America. Now, in Australia, voting is compulsory, so maybe you don't apply it to there. But um, the way things um, are, um, you know, the way, the way things look, shall I say, in the UK is that uh, there are certain people, independents, 
um, or people who are infiltrating other parties like the Greens, who, you know, when they win, and this happened recently, one bloke won, and um, instead of him saying, hooray for recycling, hooray for clean air, hooray for electric cars, and hooray for green public transport, no, no, he said, Akbar. Yeah, so they are infiltrating the political system by these means. Now, if the English could learn how to infiltrate the political system by these means, by becoming cohesive, working with each other, and um, you know, singling out independent candidates, they at the moment vastly outnumber the, how to say, the members of uh, a certain religion, and could use this to vote in certain independent candidates, um, which could then sort of undermine the uni party, so to speak, the the how to say the Davos puppets that we have who just keep everything the same, and it could actually throw enough of a spanner in the works, and everything could go our way. The only problem is, um, in order to uh, bring political integrity to Britain, you have to, you have to sort of uh, pay lip surface to the normies, and the normies unfortunately are pretty dumb, and people have bought so much in to the left, left wing narrative, or the Palestine narrative, or the, I don't know, the woke, the trans narrative, the, you know, the equality and the DEI narrative so much that you probably would have to pay some lip service to some of these people in order to get their votes. Uh, but when you get their votes, then of course you can reveal your, you know, what you're really about. And um, the thing is, say for instance, one thing that would get you a lot of people voting for you if you're an independent now, if you paid lip service to Gaza. Now I know with me, I'm, I'm not taking sides on one way or the other. I personally think that like, um, you know, that to say the, the English George Cross like, uh, people who want to celebrate St George's Day have, um, you know, are entitled to want to preserve their culture and I personally do not think that they're as racist or as far right as they're made out to be. The time of the skinheads, the bother boot wearing skinheads was such a long time ago and one of the things I do know is that a lot of the, uh, like I say, English working classes who had George Crosses did not like them, contrary to what a lot of people believe, they did not like them, they thought they were too far the other way, you know. And um, a lot of the people who are the George Cross Englishmen, the people who are often referred to as gammons, were very much against Adolf Hitler, very um, you know, proud of Winston Churchill um, winning against Adolf Hitler, so, and also are very supportive of the Jews in England at the moment. Now they don't seem to have a voice, that's the thing, they don't seem to have a voice. The trouble is that if you do go up on that stage as an independent and you paid lip service to these people, then they would be able to politically smear you as a member of the far right. That's the thing. And that's the issue that Britain has to try to overcome. But then it occurred to me all you had to do was pay lip service to Gaza, right? Now, hear me out on this one, right? I'm not saying you get to go down the George Galloway route. I'm not saying you go down the route of the fundamentalists from the religion of peace. What I'm saying is that like, if you did pay lip service to Gaza in some sort of way or other as you were trying to become an independent uh, MP, when you get your seat, um, what you say is that your, your main mission there is to put the UK first, right? And they'll ask you, but what about Gaza? And you just say, well, we'll just put to the government to have some kind of words with Netanyahu and ask him nicely to please tone it down. But the thing is, right, um, we're not into, um, we're not into Intifada, we're not into Jihad, we don't want the UK to uh, become burdened with all this stuff, but um, we could say that uh, because we care about Gaza, we'll just do our little bit to encourage the government to, um, you know, use the soft power and influence, if you like, around the world that the UK is to say to Netanyahu, go on, just, just tone it down a little bit. While at the same time, protecting the needs of the English, protecting the needs of the Jews as well. And um, how to say, in the case of the Muslims, trying to put more of the, uh, how to say, put more of the emphasis on trying to support the moderate Muslims, while putting, how can I say, a zero tolerance towards any form of terrorism, any form of fundamentalism, and any form of anything that is taking the British way of life uh, away at the expense of anything that could be construed as a foreign invasion, which I think is fair enough. Right, that's the thing. Because I do, I do think that you know, have, being, being able to get a sort of balance there between left and right, and being able to make the country more pro, how to say, libertarian, especially for the people who live there, but having to become a little bit more authoritarian with anyone who is um, trying to subvert the status quo. 
But at the same time, if we had enough of these people who were not answerable to the World Economic Forum who could get into these positions, um, then of course we would be in a much better position, I suppose, in order to uh, be able to say you know, no to globalism, no to all this bollocks, everything, you know, when it, when it came to uh, lockdown rules before, when it came to all the treaties that we had before, and when it comes to all the treaties that they, they want to bring in, all the globalist treaties, what we really need are people there who are anti-globalist, neutral on the Israel-Gaza thing, right, but want to have, I have to say, nuanced conversations about it all, zero tolerance towards any kind of, um, anything that could threaten, I have to say, a hostile regime from outside that could threaten Britain, that somehow that their lefties have become useful idiots towards, should be spoken out in, in the open. It also means that the people who are in a position to cancel you because you, I don't know, don't agree with, I have to say, certain clinics that want to, um, I have to say, that, that, that want to damage the, the puberty and the, the future, if you like, of certain kids, right? That don't want to pay lip service too much towards all the lefty causes that seem like, um, you know, sub subversion of the culture. If there could be some kind of way of doing that, that would be good. All it needs is a few people who could get together and work out how we're going to get an independent candidate, how we're going to pay just enough lip service to the, um, the zealots to, to swing them our way. But then when, we're in, in, when you're in power, how are you going to then say, right, enough is enough. Um, Britain has to, um, to say, has to get rid of all this bullshit. Now, there might be a little bunch of people out there that say, you betrayed us with their blue hair or their beard, whatever. Well, there might be enough people that say you betrayed us, but then uh, the thing about politics is such a dirty game that yeah, you have to make promises that you're going to break anyway. And the system is as such that in order that, you know, to get anywhere, you need to be somewhat, uh, what do I say, <laughs> lacking in integrity, politically expedient, and tell people what they want to hear. But the thing is that the system itself is set up that if you were in a position to be able to take the power away from the uni party by doing this, and some of the means that you would do this would have to be somewhat dirty, but of course legal, kosher, yeah, that's what I mean. Playing the system from within the system, from within the rules of the system, what's wrong with that? It's not a problem, you know? It would mean that uh, you would be able to get more independence into parliament, into councils, it would mean that you'd be able to get more dissenting and dissident voices the taking on you know, the woke agenda and fighting against it, um, supporting people who were, I would say, injured by the drinking of the tea, supporting people who uh, might be having problems with their kids at school having secret lessons um, that support a certain cult that uh, likes to promote, I would say, gender ambiguity towards kids all that sort of stuff. Um, things like immigration, regulating immigration, so that a small island like Britain with very limited space, not enough housing to go around and not enough money to build infrastructure for the floodgates which are open can be dealt with in a way that is clearly, you know, pragmatic and works in a really good way. Now, as I say, all you have to do is to see how the en enemies and infiltrators, if there are any, uh, as well as all the people who are being puppeteered by the globalists are using the political system and realise that anyone can use the political system in the UK in that way to, um, to unravel it. But there's one group of people, or two groups of people, shall we say, if you include the blue-haired lefties who are the useful idiots of another group of people who are the religion of peace. They are subverting the system in that way. And they know, and it's putty in their hands. It just means, of course, that the, the same. It just means that more and more and more people, especially the English working classes, have to work out how to do this too. And um, we need some political chaos uh, because that's what's going to happen. And when you see the results of this next election, which I think will actually shock the UK, right? Because it will be one of the biggest changes that will ever have been seen happening. Maybe that could be done. Now, if like me, you think, fuck the UK it's a sinking ship, it's a failed state, then fair enough. I mean, it certainly does look like it is. 
And um, I don't have enough faith anyway that people would take my advice. So I kind of think that it's going to go that way anyway, the way things are looking, right? Um, but I would say that if there's any chance of being able to change the UK, you have to look at what the enemies who are infiltrating the UK, the enemy within is doing, and you have to follow their playbook and use it against them. I think there's no other way at this point. You know, and like I say, if I think that Britain's failed and useless, why do I keep talking about it? Well, because, you know, I'm from there. I miss it. And I want it to be. You know, it gave me my accent, gave me my sense of humour, gave me my political and um, pop cultural references. There's a lot to be proud of. I'd like to see it not disappear, you know, and become just a airstrip one, um, a nondescript, generic, globalist, no place as we go into the future. I would like it to be able to keep enough of its identity as it goes into the future. And I think that about a lot of the rest of the Western world. But at the moment, the West is a legacy brand. It's pff, gone down, you know? It's basically becoming yesterday's news. It may survive in the future in some form or other, but it won't be, how could I say, the number one place to be. I think the number one place to be in the world in the future will be Asian countries, you know? I think the number two place to be in the future will be maybe Central and South American countries and possibly even African countries too. I think um, the United States, the way things are going at the moment is on a precipice. Either it will somehow succeed, come out the other end and triumph, or it will just implode in on itself. And Europe, well, I think Europe is in its last chance saloon right now. But as I say, for those in the UK, now that the UK has had Brexit, although it's not been done properly, it is quite independent of a lot of things that it was stuck in. Could become more independent of a lot of the things that it was stuck in. Has had um, a history of being able to soldier on, you know, no matter what, no matter how hard it's been. Um, you know, had the fucking huge empire at one point. Now you might not like it, might not like the, you know, the way it came about, but bloody hell, you know? Uh, you've, got to, you've got to admire the genius and the strength and the um, visionary nature of it. Had the Industrial Revolution, pretty much invented the modern world as we know it now, created the foundations that created the American Constitution and Bill of Rights. There's a lot of good, you know, and that's what I mean. It's lost its way a bit now. Could it find its way? It does need a lot of people to believe that it could, you know. It looks like it's a failed state at the moment to me. But, you know, maybe it'll bounce back at some point. Maybe not in the next 10 years, but maybe the decade after. But the real way of being able to get through this is for enough British people to reverse engineer how the political system works and use it to your advantage. Look at the way the lefties, and look at the way all the useful idiots and all the people who wish to subvert and undermine the culture of the UK are using the political system to infiltrate it and learn how to do it yourself. I honestly think there's no alternative at this point. Now, you know, from that, take what you will. I'm not advocating any specific policies and anything that I've said in this is just a for instance. But if you want to get a lot of people on your side, you have to pay lip service to the normies. You have to pay lip service to those who don't have much of a capacity to use their brains, the low battery thinkers, right? And, um, you know, you might not keep all your promises, but none of them do. But the idea is that at some point in the future, Britain should be able to retain uh, its structural integrity, its cultural structural integrity, right? And not be pulled into this globalist mess that it's in at the moment. The question is, how do you use the political system to do that? Alternatively, you just leave, whatever, you know, but a lot of people won't. And so I put these ideas out there in the hope that some people will think, ah, oh, well, that's an idea, yeah. But just imagine that. Less party um, candidates, more independent. They could go one or two ways. That could become a complete betrayal and destruction and an implosion of Britain from the inside. Or it could become some really good, really visionary type people saving Britain. It could work either way. But what we have to do is to remove the, uh, how could I say, the rot at the top. 
you know, the rot being Labour and Conservative and Lib Dems and the Greens. The people who just keep it going, you know, forever living in the 20th century, living in a legacy paradigm, doing nothing, paying lip service to all the wrong people and not acting, right? There's chinks in the armour, um, so you just have to destroy the armour. But who gets to destroy the armour? You know, do you want Britain to be a communist country? Do you want Britain to be an Islamic caliphate? Or do you want Britain to remain a free country and reclaim some of the freedoms that it once had before? With the, um, how can I say, with the reverse engineering of the political process that exists within the UK, it's just a question of the right people, not the wrong people, manipulating it for that reason, playing the system to destroy the present status quo. But if the right people got in and were able to rebuild Britain in a good way, reform Britain in a good way, not in a bad way, right? The trouble is the people who are doing this at the moment are the ones who are hell-bent on, on destroying it. And because I like that country, because it's where I came from and I miss going for walks in the meadows and along the rolling hills of the beautiful English countryside, I miss that. I don't really miss the politics and I don't really miss the bullshit I have to deal with with people with tall poppy syndrome. I don't miss the class divide. There's a lot of stuff I don't miss, but there are a few things that I do miss. And I would like to see them preserved forever, you know? So, I'm giving you some food for thought, you can think about that, and sorry if I've been waffling a little bit here, but hey, you know, you know me by now. So, see you later alligator, see you soon, baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow, your help will be appreciated.